The longest continual campaign of the Second World War was the Battle of the Atlantic. Fought across the Atlantic Ocean over shipping lanes and vital supply routes, the campaign resulted in the death of nearly 100,000 sailors and merchant mariners and the sinking of more than 14 million tons of shipping. The campaign encompassed more than a hundred major convoy battles and a thousand single ship encounters, and one of the most interesting occurred in the early morning hours of May 6, 1944, when the destroyer escort USS Buckley encountered the German submarine U-66. This battle to the death between these two warships was the epitome of the old saying that combat is hours and hours of boredom, followed by a few moments of sheer stark screaming terror. The short, fierce fight illustrated the, the ferocity and courage displayed in the hundreds of smaller fights that made up the longest, largest, and most complex naval battle in world history. The fight between the USS Buckley and the U-66 is history that deserves to be remembered. One innovation that changed the Battle of the Atlantic was the auxiliary, or escort carrier. These small carriers, often called baby flat tops, had less than a third of the displacement of a fleet carrier and only carried a handful of aircraft. But included as parts of convoys, they were able to cover the dangerous mid-Atlantic gap where convoys could not be protected by land-based aircraft. Allied successes in mid-1943, with 38 U-boats lost in the month of May alone, had temporarily driven the U-boats from the convoy routes of the North Atlantic, and the Kriegsmarine was focusing on the area south of the Azores, trying to interdict convoys between the United States and Gibraltar. But the U.S. strategy had a new weapon. Improvements in U-boat tracking, both by code breaking and radar, sonar, and radio tracking, allowed a different role for the baby flat tops. Instead of just defending convoys, the carriers, along with escorts, could be sent to areas where U-boats congregated and track them down. These flotillas, which began in the spring of 1943, included an escort carrier and up to a half dozen anti-submarine escort ships, and were called hunter-killer groups. On April 26, 1944, a hunter-killer group with the escort carrier USS Croaton sunk the U-488, a type of U-boat called a milch cow, a vessel that tended and refueled U-boats, off the Cape Verde Islands. A hunter-killer group led by the USS Block Island was sent to find and destroy the U-boats in the area, who may have been trying to rendezvous with the U-488. The USS Block Island was constructed by the Seattle-Tacoma Shipbuilding Corporation and launched in June of 1942. Built on a C-3 tanker hull, the Block Island displaced 7,800 long tons and carried 24 aircraft. The hunter-killer group also included four destroyer escorts, the USS Ahrens, Barr, Eugene E. Elmore, and Buckley. The group had been tracking and harassing a U-boat with which they had had intermittent contact since May 1st. They did not know it yet, but the submarine was the U-66. It was a veteran vessel, and its nine wartime patrols had sunk 33 merchant vessels, totaling more than 200,000 gross registered tons, and damaged two British torpedo boats who had tried to sink her. In tonnage sunk, the U-66 was the seventh most successful U-boat of the war. The U-66 was a Type 9C U-boat. Launched in January 1941, it had a surface displacement of 1,100 long tons and a crew of 48 officers and men. With a maximum surface speed of 18.3 knots, it was armed with six torpedo tubes, a 10.5 centimeter deck gun, and one 3.7 centimeter and a twin 2 centimeter anti-aircraft guns. In May 1944, it was commanded by Oberlieutenant Zersi Gerhard Seehausen. As suspected, U-66 was in the area to rendezvous with the U-488 for supply, but in the Battle of the Atlantic, the line between hunter and hunted was thin. Near midnight on May 5th, the Block Island's radar caught the U-boat just 5,000 yards off, apparently preparing to make a torpedo attack on the carrier. The carrier surged ahead at flank speed and executed an emergency turn to avoid the attack. USS Buckley was dispatched to the site of the radar signal. The USS Buckley was the lead ship in a class of destroyer escorts, of which 154 were produced. Buckley was launched January 9, 1943. The ship displaced 1,673 long tons and had a normal complement of 186 officers and men. It was armed with three large 3-inch guns, a quad 1.1-inch gun, eight lighter 20-millimeter guns, torpedoes and depth charges. It could make a top speed of 25 knots. In May 1944, it was commanded by Lieutenant Commander Brent M. Abel of the United States Navy Reserve. At 2.16 a.m., a Grumman Avenger, unarmed and on a night radar patrol, got a radar contact 20 miles from the Buckley and directed the ship to it. 
Moving at flank speed, literally pushing the engines and screws to their limits, the Buckley raced to the scene. The plane reported that the submarine appeared to be lying too, which suggested that it was waiting to resupply, not knowing that the U-488 had been destroyed. This gave the Buckley the opportunity to surprise the U-boat on the surface. Lieutenant Commander Brent M. Abel, in command of the Buckley, reported that there was a brilliant moon in calm sea with a gentle breeze from the northeast. The Buckley made radar contact at 2.46 a.m. and Abel called the crew to general quarters. At the time, the submarine was moving around too erratically to attempt a torpedo attack, and Abel decided to hold fire until they drew close, hoping the U-boat would think that they were its supply boat and allow them to close. At 9,000 yards, the submarine fired three flares, an apparent recognition signal for their supply boat, and the first indication that the U-boat had seen them. The Buckley closed at flank speed. At 4,000 yards, Abel reported that the U-boat was perfectly silhouetted by the bright moon. A perfect target. The Buckley turned left, bringing the U-boat dead ahead. It was a well-timed move, as the U-boat had recognized the threat. As the Buckley turned, a torpedo passed to starboard. Abel then had Buckley turn right to keep the, the submarine silhouetted by the moon, and the submarine started firing with machine guns. The Buckley commenced firing at 2,100 yards. Shots from the three-inch guns rammed into the submarine's forecastle, preventing the U-boat crew from reaching the main deck gun. The Buckley now had all guns firing, with the bridge directing the fire of the large three-inch guns based on radar. Seahausen turned the U-66, moving it so as not to be silhouetted by the moon. This gave them a chance to bring their 10.5-centimeter deck gun into action. Tracers were landing all around the Buckley, but in the dark, the Germans were firing high and most of the shots went long. The only hit scored by the U-66 deck gun pierced Buckley's stack. Abel ordered left full rudder, which brought the sub back into the moonlight. Buckley's guns were scoring hits on the submarine's conning tower, and fire from the U-66 became intermittent. Knowing he was outgunned, Seahausen was trying to make some distance to allow a torpedo attack. Lookout saw a torpedo wave coming towards the starboard bow, and Abel ordered right full rudder, causing the torpedo to pass. The Avenger was still in the air, giving direction using its radar, and that offered Buckley an advantage. The Buckley closed, firing like blazes. A shot appeared to start a fire on the U-boat's bridge. Abel had the Buckley close to 20 yards on a parallel course. The U-boat was being raked from bow to stern with machine gun fire and point-blank 3-inch fire. Abel then ordered Buckley to turn hard right, ramming the U-boat and riding up on her forecastle. Trapped, the crew of the U-boat swarmed out, trying to board the Buckley, or maybe to distract the destroyer so the submarine could make its escape. Abel reported that machine gun, tommy gun, and rifle fire knocked off many of the U-boat crew as they swarmed out of the submarine. Close quarters combat was extremely rare in the Second World War, but these two ships were locked in a desperate struggle and the crews were fighting each other hand to hand or using small arms. Sitting atop the submarine, the Buckley could not bring her three inch guns to bear and the crew was repelling boarders with whatever weapons they had at hand in a fight that would have been more fitting in the previous century. The Buckley's crew defended themselves as they could, including throwing several mess coffee cups which were on hand at a ready gun station. It was reported that two of the enemy were hit in the head with these. The crew were also throwing the heavy brass empty shell casings from the three-inch guns. During the action, Abel reported that the Buckley suffered its only casualty of the engagement, when a man bruised his fist, knocking one enemy over the side. The fighting was close. The bosun's mate in charge of the Ford ammunition party killed a man attempting to board with a 45 caliber pistol, not a common occurrence in the Battle of the Atlantic. The crew of the Buckley was now firing at the submarine crew with rifles and tommy guns. Abel reversed engine, backing off the U-boat to prevent further boarding. Five Germans still aboard were disarmed and taken prisoner. The U-66 was now trying to make distance again, and Abel ordered the Buckley to charge at flank speed. Abel's plan was to come alongside and fire depth charges so that they would explode under the submarine. But the submarine, either intentionally or out of control, turned towards the Buckley. The Buckley swerved, preventing a direct ram, but the U-66 scored a glancing blow, breaching the destroyer's hull before rolling under and shearing off the Buckley's starboard shaft. As it hit, the U-boat rolled over 60 degrees, and for a moment, some of the Buckley's crew could see into the con, which was described as a flaming shambles. Too close to use depth charges, the torpedo men threw hand grenades. One went down the hatch before exploding. The ruined submarine passed the stern, its screws still turning, making 15 knots. This offered a perfect shot for the Buckley's 3-inch guns, which scored several direct hits on the con. The submarine then began to dive, but with the hatch on the now-abandoned con and the forward hatch still open. As it went under, several loud explosions were heard. Seahausen had ordered the U-66 scuttle to prevent her secret equipment from being captured. The entire engagement, from radar contact to sinking of the U-66, had lasted just 16 minutes. Buckley searched for two hours, rescuing survivors. 
36 of the U-boat's crew survived, including four officers. Oberlieutenant Zersi Gerhard Seehausen was not among the survivors. The survivors reported that they were convinced that they had been attacked by a light cruiser rather than a destroyer escort. For such a close quarters fight, it wasn't overly deadly, but still, both vessels were fighting to the death, and the Buckley easily could have been lost had either of the U-66 torpedoes struck home. The Buckley had lost its starboard screw with the shaft sheared off. They had a 5-inch hull breach in the engine room, 2 feet above the waterline, and damage to the bow from the ram. The ship required nearly a month in dry dock for repairs. In the 16-minute fight, the Buckley expended 105 3-inch rounds, 2,720 millimeter rounds, 418 1.1-inch rounds, and more than 300 rounds from small arms, and two hand grenades. For his command during the action, Lieutenant Commander Abel was awarded the Navy Cross. The Kriegsmarine would get its revenge less than a month later, when on May 29th, the U-549 snuck through the destroyer escort screen and sunk the USS Block Island. But by then, the Battle of the Atlantic was in its waning years. The Allies sunk 248 U-boats in 1944, and the U-boats had largely been driven from the North Atlantic. Still, the Allies continued to take shipping losses from the U-boat menace through the end of the war. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.